is Professor Robert Williams from the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, USA. Uh, Professor Williams is a senior research scholar at the Space Telescope Science Institute and also an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University. He got his PhD uh, from the University of Wisconsin in 1964 and then was a professor at the University of Arizona for 18 years. Between 1993 and 1998, he served as the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, which operates the Hubble Space Telescope. During his tenure as the director, he devoted uh, a significant portion of his director's discre discretionary time uh, to use Hubble to image a tiny patch of the sky, which later became known as the Hubble Deep Field. And this has opened a new era in astronomical research. Uh, later, there are many more deep fields uh, coming online, and that has opened uh, several new windows into a deep space. He also promoted science, especially from Hubble, to the public, and uh, make people aware of the great sciences done by astronomers. Uh, today, he will tell us all the great uh, things that Hubble has uh, done. And so that's welcome, Professor Williams. Thank you. Uh, great. A real pleasure for me to be back here in Taipei at the uh, Academia Seneca, uh, talking about two topics and that are uh, some of my favorites, Hubble Space Telescope and the universe. Um, so I'm told I just have 50 minutes to talk, and uh, the slides uh, generally take me at least an hour, 10 minutes. So I'm going to have to go fast. For those of you who have uh, looked at this, this uh, is a uh, editing job that I did of films that the astronauts on the last servicing mission in 2009 took of the Hubble, um, in which they uh, introduced some uh, new equipment into the telescope. And generally, after each servicing mission, the astronauts go around, they come to the institute, and uh, they give a presentation, and basically, uh, this film uh, gives a description of exactly what they accomplished. <laughs> Um, well, I'll let that play, but don't let that distract you. So uh, you'll notice on my title page that I am violating every uh, protocol uh, for giving PowerPoint presentations. And I do a lot of mentoring, and one of the things I always tell my, the people I mentor is, keep your slides simple. <laughs> but, and so this is the first time I've ever done this, but I thought I'd put uh, basically a synopsis of my entire talk on the first uh, slide, so at least you get uh, a, a picture of what I'm trying to get across. Um, Hubble Space Telescope is uh, uh, very well known, very famous. It, it is a unique facility, of course, being in space. But I believe that its most important contribution to science is not just the discoveries it has made. I would say that the impact that the telescope and its observations have had with the public worldwide in making them aware of what science tries to do and that science is a process, a way of thinking, not just discovery, is the great contribution of Hubble Space Telescope. And so you see some of the important things that I believe uh, exist for the, the Hubble telescope represents. Now, uh, the most important thing perhaps is the fact that it produces beautiful images. The most iconic image is this so-called uh, Eagle Nebula, Pillars of Creation that has been called, that somehow uh, the color, every, the form, everything about it has fascinated people. But you get interesting things like the fact that Jupiter and Saturn have aurora just like we have on the Earth. <coughs> so electrons from the solar wind captured in strong magnetic fields, and uh, Hubble has given uh, beautiful images there. Uh, it is something where people have uh, worked in space. And space being a very hostile environment, of course, this has added to the interest that the public has had in the telescope, and I believe is uh, partly responsible for its popularity. There's no question that it has made major discoveries. And 
there are many, and I'll talk about some of them, but here's a slide from John McCall, who had a lot to do with the inception of the telescope, that demonstrated that quasars, quasi-stellar sources, in fact, the, are at the energetic activity at the centers of galaxies, and with the Hubble, you could actually see these galaxies. So it demonstrated for the first time that quasars were not really isolated from galaxies. It's just that they were so bright that it was difficult before Hubble uh, to actually see the uh, galaxies. This is, let me switch to this. I'm not maybe a little too bright. Um, uh, you know that uh, Hubble started off poorly. There was a mismatch between the primary mirror here and the secondary mirror that caused it to have serious spherical aberration. That was corrected three years after launch in the first servicing mission, and during which time the public was very critical, of course, taxpayers' uh, dollars, 7.5 billion U.S. dollars uh, that uh, uh, went to a telescope that did not perform well. And this is one of the funniest political cartoons. The first photo is from the Hubble, and here you see a picture of the moon and Saturn, and then here, crowning uh, the American taxpayer. So we had to go through a very difficult period, but after the first servicing mission corrected it, these images came out, really things changed, and all the discoveries started occurring. I should say that outreach has been a very important part of Hubble, and we have, let me yeah, turn this off now. I like that film, but too much competition here. It's not a good one. <laughs> so, so I'll just start speaking. <laughs> There's a great data archive, many terabytes of data. All of the data with its calibration is easily accessible. You get it over the internet. There's no cost, uh, the little electronic form that you fill out. For the first time now, the number of papers each year that come out for Hubble observations from the archive exceeds the number of papers that are coming out based on the observations of that year. In other words, the telescope now its archive is being more productive than ongoing observations. Now realize it's been in operation for 23 years now. So very impressive data archive, important <coughs> for any unique scientific facility, but I think uh, that's not a surprise to any of us in this room. But the outreach, very important. Hubble site, even a lot of these slides that I get, I get it from our website, hubblesite.org. Again, every uh, image of Hubble is uh, uh, available there. So all of this is what has caused Hubble to really be a premier a facility, uh, successful, and something that the most taxpayers would say is worth the, 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 the money and has, has increased the visibility, the importance of science and the, the process of scientific deduction uh, in the, the broader community. Okay, great. So if I say nothing else, there's Hubble Space Telescope and the reason that it is a paradigm, I believe, for large major facilities. And if I were speaking in Geneva, I'd say the same thing to them that I'm telling you about how the LHC should be operated. Well, uh, Hubble had a major role in discovering a new force, right? The expansion of the universe is accelerating. I'll say something about that at the end of my talk. That's pretty important, an unknown force that we have discovered. Uh, that's important. The Higgs boson, also important. And so uh, the Geneva facility, I would say, has much in common with this. And now the LHC, of course, is the most expensive project. It's, I think, about 10 billion either US dollars or euros. And the uh, current cost of uh, the 25 years of development of the Hubble and 23 years of operation is now less than that. It's about $8, eight billion. So, Let's talk about some of the science that has been done with the Hubble. And we'll start with uh, planets around other stellar systems. It is interesting, uh, Lyman Spitzer, Princeton professor, wrote a report for the Rand Corporation, which at that time was part of McDonnell Douglas Aircraft. It's a, we call it a think tank. This is in 1946, just after the end of World War II. 
where the German development of the V-2 rocket made it clear that one could think of putting payloads in space. And so they wrote a small report that had in a, several appendices that were not even part of the report. Lyman Spitzer wrote an eight-page appendix stating that it would be interesting to put a telescope in space because you could study the formation of stars and study planets and their characteristics. He was referring to planets in our own solar system. So now 65 years later, what we will spend some time talking about is the fact that Hubble is making, right on the verge of making interesting analyses of planets that we still do not directly detect. We uh, detect them against the star about which they are orbiting. And so we actually know something about the atmospheres of planets around other stars. Amazing development. Now, uh, Hubble is not a premier uh, facility for discovering planets, but it has uh, actually detected several. This is uh, one of the brightest stars in the sky, southern sky, Fulmar. And here is a series of images basically taken by Paul Callis and collaborators at University of California, Berkeley, where an occulting disk has been placed to block out the light of the bright star to see what's around it. And this is in the far red, uh, and so you see actually some cool, a cool dust ring that uh, we believe is part of the formation of a stellar system, a planetary system around this star. And they have detected here in a series of images, and you don't see it very well here. I'm going to show you a better example. But they actually see this uh, object uh, moving in its orbit. And so here is actually an image of a protoplanet in formation. It's at a very large distance from the star, twice as far as Pluto is in our own solar system. And the mass of this object is uh, uh, several times the mass of Jupiter. <coughs> So it is, in a way, an actual image taken by Hubble of, of, of the solar planet, so-called exoplanet. The fact is, Hubble is really not doing the best uh, at the detection of uh, such exoplanets. Ground-based telescopes are. Now, Hubble, of course, is above the atmosphere, and so it's free of the disturbing influences the distortion of the atmosphere, but ground-based telescopes now are able to correct for those distortions by a clever technique using what's called a laser guide star. You take a sodium laser, shine it up to the sodium D layer, the top of the Earth's atmosphere, 95 kilometers up, and you pulse it. So you excite the sodium uh, at 95 kilometers and get it to emit a coherent uh, uh, ray of light back down to the telescope, which the atmosphere distorts, but then which, since we know it was coherent when it started out, you can correct for it by using a flexible mirror. And so you can actually correct for the Earth's uh, distortion and produce images that are better than Hubble gets. Why? Because these large telescopes, this is not an example, I think this is Magellan, but I'm, I'm not sure of that. But uh, we have 10 meter telescopes on the ground, Hubble's diameter is only 2.5 meters. And so you actually get better images with these ground based telescopes. And here's, since uh, many of you are not in astronomy and in physics, let me, you start off, let's say, with uh, undisturbed uh, uh, wave front passing through interstellar space, it hits the Earth's atmosphere and becomes distorted. If you assume that you have perfect telescope optics, you take a nice image like this, and of course the Earth's atmosphere distorts it. But if you send the laser beam up, and I'm waiting, <laughs> and you have a flexible mirror here in which you can take this coherent beam and actually correct for it, then you can take this distorted wave front with the flexible mirror and make it coherent. And so at the same time you're doing this with the telescope to correct the wave front, you can do the same thing to whatever object you're trying to photograph. And in fact, Hubble, which is not sensitive to infrared wavelengths, but ground-based telescopes, some of them are, and the 
infrared is a better place to study planets because the contrast between a cool planet and a hot star is, is greater in the infrared. And so with ground-based telescopes using laser guide stars, an image like this in a nondescript uh, star here taken down in Chile with ESO telescope, again, there's a star. Put an occulting disk there, you still see some scattered light, so you see the airy rings, but very nice uh, three planetary system that you see photographed from a large telescope on the ground. So that's better than Hubble can do. But here's an example of an extraplanetary system, and in fact, this has also been uh, detected uh, with the Hubble, it turns out. And uh, uh, we can see the uh, motion of uh, these objects around this particular star. So here are some examples of actually detection of extrasolar planetary systems. Most of the planetary systems that we know about, though, are not detected like this. Uh, you don't get the resolution, the spatial resolution that you need unless you're looking at a relatively nearby star. The fact is, most of the planetary systems that we know of have been detected in one of two ways. Uh, the Kepler satellite, which operated for four years, and it uh, just became inoperative about one or two months ago when the reaction wheels finally uh, had problems. It looked at a particular area in the sky with a very large camera, concentrating on that area of the sky, simply looking for changes in the brightness that were periodic of stars caused by transits or occultations or eclipses of planets across the face of the stars. And so for a period of some years, it simply measured very accurate brightness variations to see if there were any periodic uh, fluctuations that could be attributed to the existence of planets. Even though you don't directly detect the planet, you infer of its existence. Um, let's see. Um, so the planetary system, well, there's two ways of detecting it. A planet this way. Obviously, one is, and of course, there's a very small fraction of the star that most planets uh, will uh, uh, subtend. But uh, what you see is, again, you're just measuring the brightness of the star, and then when this thing crosses it, you notice a decrease. And typically, we're looking for a difference of one part in 10 cubed or one part in 10 over 4. So you have to have very accurate measurements. And it's difficult to do this under the Earth's atmosphere simply because atmospheric turbulence uh, gives you fluctuations that are as great as that. Best to do it in uh, space, which is why Kepler was so successful. Another way of detecting planets, of course, is the fact that you have the planets uh, moving around the star. The very center, of course, uh, of the system resides typically within the star, but it, the star does actually move in response to the planet. And if you have an instrument that can detect velocity differences through spectroscopy of an accuracy of a few meters per second, which is not possible, you can actually infer the existence of planets. And so there are three ways of uh, detecting planets around other systems. For the nearby stars, you actually can get the photographs of a few of them. For others, you d detect differences in the brightness that are episodic or in the velocity, the so-called radial velocity, produced by the motion of the planet around the star. You're looking at the star, not the planet. And at the present time, this is already out of date. In fact, things are changing so rapidly that uh, if I show you a slide that's a week old, it's out of date. We now know the existence of more than 900 planets around other stars. Most of them have not been directly seen. They have been inferred either from transits, occultations, or from radial velocity variation. But you can determine some uh, based on some assumptions what the radii and what the masses of the planetary uh, systems are. And here we have a uh, comparison of the Earth, uh, sorry, the Sun's, uh, the, our solar system, Mercury, Mars, Venus, Earth, and the giant planets. 
And you can see where most of the planets reside. Strong selection effect. They tend to be, most of the planets that we have discovered, not surprisingly, or in other systems, tend to be more massive and larger than the systems in our own solar system. Why? Because it's easier to detect fluctuations if the planet's large. It's easier to detect difference in the radial velocity if the planet is massive. So there's a very strong selection effect that leads us to populate the diagram up here uh, at the, the expense of other objects that uh, exist down here, but we haven't detected them yet. It uh, just requires too much accuracy. But the interesting thing is the following. So even forgetting the fact there are very strong selection effects here, it turns out that of the 900 exoplanets, and uh, some of them are in multiple planet systems, so there are less than that the number of systems, and I don't know what the number is, but let me say 600 or 500 other systems. None of them, none, zero, are like our own solar system, where you have these inner rocky planets, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then the gas giants. Instead, what you have are these large planets, and most of them, or many, in fact most I think is correct, turn out to have very short uh, orbital periods, very small orbital periods. Again, very strong selection effect. If this is a star and here's a planet and it's far out, you're only going to get an eclipse, an occultation, if the orbital plane happens to be exactly aligned with you. The closer the planet is to the star, the more likelihood that you're going to be able to get an eclipse without the orbital plane being exactly in your line of sight. So again, strong selection effect that favors the discovery of planets with short orbital periods. Same is true uh, for the uh, systems uh, if you're detecting them by a radial velocity variation. But for those systems for which you have a close-in planet that enables you to detect the variation and the existence of a planet, it turns out that when you do a very accurate analysis, there are other planetary systems, other episodic uh, variations that lead to, to the existence, the inference of planets having uh, larger orbits. And so that's what is responsible for this peak uh, here. In any event, there you can see, again, strong selection effects, but we have a number of uh, planetary systems now that we know about. Most of them turn out to have masses greater than Jupiter. Most of them have orbital periods of the order of days. They're really close to the star, so they're very hot, and that has given rise to this term, uh, hot Jupiters. Um, so Hubble uh, is not involved with uh, either the radial velocity variations or the eclipses, that is in the discovery of these systems. You have Kepler and ground-based telescopes doing that. But what Hubble does do is once it takes these systems, we know of their existence, then it can do the spectroscopy of the system, particularly in occulting systems and transiting systems where the planet crosses the face of the star, and where so the starlight passes through this atmosphere and modifies the spectra, it enables you to do a spectroscopic analysis of the atmosphere. <coughs> really remarkable. And we're talking about small effects because uh, typically the uh, solid angle, the fraction of the star that a planet occults is 10 to the minus 3. And so you're looking at a bright, relatively bright star, and you're during a short transit time, you're trying to detect a change in the spectra and a one part in 10 cubed. And that's tough. But here is a model of what you would expect the absorption of a, a, a hot Jupiter to look like. Um, of, <coughs> Basically, where we're not worrying about the influence of the star at this point. We're, if you pass light through uh, a hot Jupiter, you would expect to see in the optical and the infrared a spectrum looks like this. 
sodium uh, famous D uh, uh, transition, you know, very strong resonance transition, uh, 5900, uh, 5889 angstrom, will give you atomic absorption here. And then molecules, carbon monoxide, water, uh, potassium, uh, methane, and some ammonia, will give you absorption in the infrared. And so one important thing to learn from this diagram is, if you're going to try to detect uh, the constituents of an uh, atmosphere here, note that the molecular absorption tends to be much broader and take out uh, more of the background light than the atomic species. The so-called equivalent width, or the amount of radiation that is absorbed by atomic features is less than the molecular. So it's very difficult to detect atomic species. It's much easier to detect the molecular. Now, in most atmospheres, which are cooler, you're going to get molecular species. So the point of all of this, if you want to do an analysis of planetary atmospheres, don't, do it. don't concentrate in the optical. Much more difficult. Go to the infrared. The problem with Hubble is it's not really an infrared telescope. We have some new detectors that were installed on that four servicing mission that enable us to go out to, well, actually about uh, two, two to three microns. So we can look at these features. But in fact, the further infrared is really uh, much richer and is one of the important reasons for the development of the successor to Hubble, the James Webb Space Telescope. And I'll come back to that. So there actually have been several recent papers that have claimed detection of water in some of the planetary atmospheres. So the situation is this. There's two stars here, HD, doesn't matter, XO1b. So you have <clears throat> this eclipse. Notice that we're talking here. It turns out that these are... Uh, the, the ratio of the planet radius to the star radius is relatively large. And it, this is a 1% effect, okay? That's better than a 0.1% effect. So what you do is you take a spectrum here in the middle of the eclipse and try to look for changes in the spectrum of the star with the data obtained over a very brief interval here, uh, typically 30 minutes, let's say. And you can see the error bars. Now it turns out, I should have pointed this out in the previous slide, so the strongest water feature here, H2O, is at 1.4 microns. So if we're gonna look to see if there's water, and of course, why if I look for water? Life. And uh, so here is, and this is a little obtuse, here is a plot of transit depth. And so I, I personally wouldn't be doing it this way, but uh, I didn't uh, write this particular paper. But the point is, the star spectrum is in blue for these two stars. And the difference between that the planetary absorption makes, you can see here, causing a greater depth of absorption. So deeper absorption is actually uh, vertical on this uh, uh, upward rather than downward. Uh, so this is the uh, opposite of normal astronomical convention. But the point is this, that this group and, yeah, Drake Deming, um, Peter McCullough, whose office is just right next to mine at the Institute, there's a group of people that claim that the uh, feature that they see here, increased absorption just in this brief period in eclipse, uh, to them is a tentative identification of H2O in that particular planet. Uh, I would say that uh, here it's much more tentative. Um, Draw your own conclusions. Actually, whether or not water has actually been detected, to me, is not important. It, it may have been. What is important is the fact that clearly we are right on the verge, and particularly with new 
facilities like James Webb, which will have an eight and a half meter mirror, and be very sensitive in the infrared.